Oh. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. I can't believe that you are here on a Sunday morning, first thing in the morning. Um, I'm really honored, I'm really happy to be honored to have you here. Um, and thank you very much for this very generous introduction. We have this really wonderful relationship with friends of San Diego Architecture, with Catherine, going back many, many years. And each time, actually, we have a new project, we feel so gratified to be invited back here and to be able to share it with the community. Um, okay, so this book that we've been working on for a number of years, I don't know if you'll see it, but Architecture and the Housing Question, it came out last year <coughs> and in hard, hardback. And right now, they recently came out in paperback, a bit more affordable. So if you are affiliated with a library, you may want to ask your library to purchase it so that people who can't afford it, it's still quite expensive, especially students will have access to it. Um, so that's an occasion for us to talk about it, to celebrate a bit with you the paperback, with electronic version also. But I should also say that I find it very difficult to speak about a work, a book, a volume, edited volume in this case, after it is completed and it is in the world published. It's very difficult because whatever Julia and I can tell you about this will be quite insufficient to do justice to all these authors, many, many authors from around the world who contributed to this book. Um, but I will do something that I haven't done before. Um, trying to engage basically what we mean by the housing question, I'll try to bring an example from, a, from actually one of our local communities, which is basically maybe a better way of trying to understand and address. Uh, I mean, there's obviously a larger global aspect, the world history of housing that we are trying to kind of engage. But at the same time, I hope you'll see that it is also relevant for our own locality. So here it is, um, it's, it's the book, that's a snapshot from the, um, from the web page that one of our students prepared for us, thehousingquestion.com. So if you click on these things, you can get information about all these authors and who they are. Who they are. They are, I think, really among the leading historians of architecture and historians of urban uh, planning. Okay, so something that I haven't done before and I want to do it with you today is I want to share with you an experience that helped me clarifying the housing question. <clears throat> so it is basically a conversation that took place, I'm looking at my notes, to in February 2020. I jotted down then what was said uh, with the hope that maybe I can use it in a later text in the introduction. I never did. Little had I known that, of course, in 2020, February, we were just on the verge of the biggest uh, health emergency, public health, health emergency of our time, COVID-19 pandemic. And after that, basically, nothing was really quite the same. So many of us came to think about housing and the housing question quite differently after that. So, the experience that I want to relate to you is basically um, the setting with, was the conference room of a community center in Encinitas, which is our own community. We love dearly Encinitas, we care about it. Uh, where basically the senior uh, city planner called the citizens, citizens of Encinitas, concerned citizens, to inform about the current unfolding uh, housing situation. So the city of Encinitas was under pressure to adopt the newest phase of the state mandated housing element and once more was falling behind uh, basically the state mandated quotas for low and modern income housing. So and the meeting revealed a dizzying information about, uh, about basically California's newest amendments to its housing bills, 
and how the county's association of governments calculated and passed down these quotas. California legislature wrote ever more complex measures ostensibly to cut through the tape, red tape uh, without a, red, uh, a hint of irony. So they keep like making California's bill, as far as I can tell, even more complex. The California Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD, the blacklisted Encinitas after its voters rejected twice amendments to city zoning plan. Measure T proposed to introduce mixed-use housing and was, was voted down in November 2016. And Measure U proposed ups to upzone select parcels distributed throughout the city. It was very hard to understand the logic of this distribution, but it sounded like as if they seen housing a bitter pill to swallow. So this mm -hmm. densification of parcels throughout the city were distributed as if they are basically kind of unwanted by the city. So it seemed that the city was trying to meet the housing quota and little else mattered when it comes to city planning principles or environmental protection. And basically the ballot box measure came with a, with a desperate plea from the city to the voters. This is the last chance to keep local control of zoning and development, they said. And Nevertheless, the ballot measure was rejected resoundingly in November 2018. Okay, of course, is this the end of the story? You know, it isn't. Right? And the Building Industry Association, I don't know if anybody here is a member, um, the, powerful, the powerful developers lobby sued the city of Encinitas for failing to comply with the state mandate Unbeknown to many um, residents, participants in that particular meeting, is that only a couple of days before, the city received from Sacramento a notice of violation and, and also revocation of compliance documents. And the city attorneys were scrambling to write an appeal to this. This meant that the city was now exposed to very expensive lawsuits by private parties. The punishment for not meeting the state's housing uh, targets would be paid very dearly by the public. So I don't want to say that the bill is the bill is going to be footed by by the taxpayers because I mean when your city is published, everybody pays. Like in most opportunities more social services. In, a, in an absurd twist, now the city of Encinitas, I'm talking about 2020, it was forced by the state um, to sue its own citizens to disenfranchise their right to vote on local zoning ordinances. Um, okay, that's interesting. So, because the city is the public, and the city, they are the citizens, the city represents the public, but then the, the city was desperately looking for an entity that represents the citizens so that the city can sue them to take the people's right to vote on zoning ordinances away. <clears throat> so, Back to the same meeting in February 2020, the city planner directed the participants into thematic workshops. One of the planner's PowerPoint slides, and I took note then, read, affordability is not a fair housing issue unless it affects a protected class. Okay, English is not my first language. Actually, it's my third language. I learned it quite late. Um, and I'm always very alert to issues of translation. <clears throat> this sentence is quite untranslatable to another language. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I understand, and, and I'm not a California housing expert, of course, so maybe you can help me out here. Um, 
but I think basically this is a reference to the Fair Housing Act, right? Which prohibits discrimination in housing because of race, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, identity, familial status, and disability. These are all protected classes. I should also add that in 2020, a bit later than this meeting, uh, the federal government once more um, basically decided to implement the law in order to also overcome, quote, systemic inequality in housing. So in other words, like, regardless of whether basically, say, the city has a discriminatory intent or not, if you end up by creating a situation of perpetual segregation, right, this was a violation of the law. So I wonder to this day what uh, basically the Encinitas meant with this statement, and I've seen it like exactly repeated in the presentations of other California cities. Um, I think what basically What's happening is that the city placed affordability and discrimination uh, into two distinct ad administrative categories. And so they were trying to reassure the anxious citizens that no one will get in trouble for denying housing to the poor because poverty is not a protected class. <laughs> and that also the play of words because the poor is a class, right? Except it's not protected. Meanwhile, meanwhile, at that time, and as still does, a class war was raging on social media, pitting North County's suburban residents against large developers uh, who benefited from incentives and waivers from environmental protections, also pitting the privileged homeowners against the future and presumably more diverse tenants. When it comes to housing, everyone talked about regulation. I never seen a country where everyone is so incredibly knowledgeable about municipal code. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. Like, when you go to other countries to study and ask them, like, What's, what are the development, development standards? There's like, well, what are you talking about? Right? But here, everybody, every citizen, at least in those meetings, seems to know. <laughs> So during all these endless hearings that we participated in, and as I'm very curious also as a community member in my newfound, uh, I mean, we've been living there for 12 years, community, a conservative speaker likened Sacramento to a commissariat. I'm, I love this because we study Soviet mm -hmm. people. So I realized that my conservative colleagues like comparing Sacramento to the Soviet Union. What they were, because what they were doing, they were wrestling away local control from the local governments. And the community character, community character was at risk. Progressives in the audience, and they were many, objected, of course, to the loss of environmental protections, but more so to the objective that the incentives uh, given to private developers and question why as many as six high-end market rate apartments needed to be given away to developers in a place like Encinitas, um, just basically to produce one affordable unit. Because if only 15 and 20% of housing was set aside to be affordable, uh, one would need to build an entirely new Encinitas just to be able to meet the state's targets. I think we can agree with that. I borrowed from Julian. Um, okay, during this meeting, there's an impasse, right? What do we do, right? What do we do? How do we comply? And then one participant raised his hand and asked, if you need affordable housing, 
if we need affordable housing, and we do, we desperately need affordable housing, why don't we design and build 100% affordable units on city-owned land? <clears throat> A moment of silence, two perspectives. A moment of silence. And then the senior planner deliberately walked toward the person who asked the question and said just <laughs> and this public housing is not building. Public housing is not building. As Ronald Martin, uh, one of the contributors to our book, wrote in a different work, The Art of Inequality, it is nearly impossible to use the word public in public anymore. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to, to housing. By 2007-2008, more mortgage foreclosure crisis, a sleight of hand had removed public housing from consideration as a viable option. This Martin calls privatization of imagination. Now the only admissible approach to housing were market-oriented. The disappearance of public, I think, is not only merely due to aversion to government-built housing, but it is also a bit of a myth that passes for history. What the senior planner meant that day in response to this question was that, don't you know, we've been there, done that. The utopian visions for public housing in American cities ended in failure. Don't you know? So I'm interested in this kind of historical consciousness. Yet, did they? Public housing should not be conflated with mass housing, meaning like very dense towers and slabs in the park. Yet there is also, I think, America's fear of the projects, locking urban poor and racial minorities into segregated enclaves that lurks behind the stigma that is associated with the word, with the word public housing. One book that I find very useful is this one, um, and I'm happy to recommend it. Public Housing Myths, edited by the authors that you see here. Nicholas Bloom. Okay. <coughs> the chapters are organized, I think they organize their book brilliantly by uh, urban legends or myths. And that in each of them, a, an author tries to basically dismantle, dismantle this idea. The first, it goes like, public housing stands alone. Myth number one. Modernist architecture failed public housing. Myth number two. Only immigrants still meet, uh, live in Euro European public housing. <coughs> what else? Public housing is only for poor people. Also a myth. Tenants did, not in, uh, tenants did not invest in public housing. Why should they? Well, another myth. Okay. Why should they go out Okay, so I hesitated to bring this story from Encinitas to you. Um, well, first of all, because it's an affluent community, right? It's a privilege to be able to live in Encinitas, right? And uh, Catherine actually just yesterday sent me a newsletter, and according to which, how much I think there are 160,000 California households come from court ordered evictions in any given year. 160,000. <clears throat> right? And surely Encinitas is not the place. We should start talking about it. Yet what transpired in this community center of the small town is symptomatic of a shift in public policy away from providing and distributing welfare to the people, like public education, public health, housing, to one that maintains that markets, uh, when given the right incentives, will do social good. 
Although he rarely used it in his daily life, critical literature um, calls this form of governing neoliberalism. As many scholars have observed, we are by no means the first ones, that the top-down application of neoliberal policies across the world since 1970s amounted to privatization, deregulation, dismantling of the social safety net, especially in health and housing, de-unionization, <clears throat> and making labor precarious, to count only a few effects. So this neoliberal turn has had large effects in California's eviction crisis, um, all the way it had effect on the refugee crisis in the camps of Somali, Somali Kenya border. One of our contributors write about that. It had effect on Turkey's mass housing authority, which has completely transformed the urban landscape. And it also transformed actually post-communist, post-Maoist China as well. Interestingly, and judging from California, the government didn't become any smaller. It just got more complex. With ever more uh, incentives from the state, housing laws and regulations had framed what French thinker, philosopher Michel Foucault called the art of governing. No one knew for sure where each jurisdiction, state, county, and city started and where it ended, every interest group sued each other. <clears throat> we are introduced to a government that, instead of building housing for the poor, calculates if a housing project is profitable enough for the developer. The government's relation to housing as an area of expertise has also <clears throat> changed. No more teams of designers seeking innovative and architectural solutions under neoliberalism, the expertise that the city offered is a form of compliance and risk management. When we hear housing, we come to expect land use attorneys rather than architects and urban designers. So uh, I took too much time. So very quickly, I will show you the I mean, these, these are some of our student projects when we were doing Istanbul program, taking our students from San Diego to Istanbul, sharing with them basically the huge housing transformation of the city, where Istanbul becomes a city like this and other urban cities. Uh, but as I was actually talking with you about, is that what's very unusual about our group of scholars is that when you are usually an expert on Eastern Europe, when you are expert on third world development, when you are expert about American inner cities or American suburbia, you write in the, your own corners, you never talk to one another. So with this occasion of a very unusual organization by bringing these different people from around the world in America, we are able to just like make very unusual like correspondences and we wanted to see what kind of constellation would come out of this when people talk to one another. And just to also finish, of course, I would love to stay here 10 hours and share with you everything, but we are not gonna do that. And instead, I, I need to just basically emphasize that this is the section that actually Juliana is going to quickly talk about, especially, but also here we talk about social housing. So especially this, like basically what happens to the issue of desegregation and the housing in place? How do basically <clears throat> architects deal with the stigma that is associated with housing? <clears throat> okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna change gear a bit and uh, do like you were doing so my voice doesn't carry very well. Um, so um, I'm going to actually talk about case studies. I'm going to show you three of them. Um, and um, I'm going to, they're from very different contexts. One is from the Soviet Union, 
Uh, one is from Turkey, and the third one is an American one. And um, it's, a, it's a way to signal that uh, a few things. One is that, uh, as you can see, uh, housing is as much a political and social question as it is an, an architectural one, so I'm going to uh, present about that. Um, and that the fact that you know uh, architects have experimented with the question of housing for almost as long as we've had um, you know modern architecture, so it's a 200 years of innovations and reforms, each one of them uh, promising to produce less expensive, better quality housing for more people. Um, so, um, and, and another observation is that housing. Has always been in crisis, right? That's it's not. Um, um, there, there have always been questions of availability, affordability, health and safety, overcrowding, uh, housing as a site of terrible ills, but also um, amazing promise. I think one of the reasons we perceive it today more as a crisis, although it's been uh, an ongoing one. Uh, it, why it's such a scandal today is that I think it affects many more middle class, uh, you know, college educated millennials, etc. But truly, if you look at the history since the 19th century, housing, uh, you know, working class people have always experienced housing, housing shortages. Okay, so um, three case studies, as I said, uh, and perhaps with a few observations of what we can learn from them. The first one is from the chapter by Daria Bocharnikova uh, and about these, uh, these Soviet uh, neighborhood units, uh, which were really designed to uh, produce, obviously, shelter housing on a, on a very large scale, but also something that they refer to as collective consciousness. I think something that we would call today perhaps a spirit of community. And you're going to see that housing was never, was always understood as a, um, the module for housing was always the neighborhood, right? It's, it was never just a building. So living in these, in these housing projects, which we refer to often as mass housing, right? They're often, one of the myths uh, is that they were often uh, grabbed and uh, unhappy. Um, I, hopefully I'll, I'll convince you otherwise, but it was also seen as a form of uh, political education for the inhabitants and as a way for them to understand their place, their position, their participation in, uh, in the larger, in a larger social whole. Um, okay, so uh, just a little bit of historical context. In Russia, there is a, uh, there is a revolution in 1917. Uh, it's called the, um, you know, the Russian Revolution. And one of the first things that, uh, that comes out of that is a decree on land, uh, which makes land, uh, removes land from, from private ownership. It becomes a public good. There is often a lot of misunderstanding about the Soviet uh, Union about that. Uh, people perhaps understand that there's no such thing as private property. That's actually not, very, not true. A lot of these apartments which were built in the 50s were privately owned. Uh, at very low cost, but it's the land that was made sort of public. What does it mean? Well, um, it means, why did they do that? Uh, they understood that as a primary way to address, um, you know, to uproot inequality and um, create mechanisms for the, for the redistribution of wealth. But it also, the fact that land was no longer fragmented into private ownership of parcels meant that Soviet uh, politicians, architects, urban planners had at their, um, at, had available unprecedented opportunities for social and spatial experimentation, right? So just imagine how difficult it is for us to pass a train from San Francisco to Los Angeles because of the, you know, Imagine if, all had, if the government could simply plan um, at, at, a large, at a large scale, right? Um, so um, just to give you a sense, so if, if they don't get around to building housing until after World War II, it's a very poor 
it's a very poor country. But after World War II, starting really from the 1950s, they launch housing as a, a national priority. And just to give you some numbers, in a country that had um, a, around 250 million people, uh, they build a hundred. They they rehouse 140 million people. So almost half of the population within uh, between 1959 and 1974, so within 25 years, is uh, given uh, at very low cost um, new access to these newly built housing uh, housing. Um, housing developments, right? So, first observation here, right? When we say that housing is a political project, it means that it it is embedded in the um, you know it it's it's embedded in the priorities of a of a nation. Uh, it 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 means the it means the whole range of uh, participants, right? Um, it requires decisions as a society scale rather than one by one. And um, yeah, so I think I'm going to hammer that point uh, very, very often. Um, so there were uh, several innovations that the company who make that extraordinary large housing campaign. Uh, one of them is that they made it a priority, right? That's when we say when it's political, it's a, what matters to that society. They made it a priority to give one apartment per family. Uh, that is in the context in which the vast majority of people in cities live in shared housing, uh, often one room per family, with shared bathrooms and kitchens. Uh, that sort of had been the norm. And if you think that's just a Soviet problem, um, I don't know, uh, you know, we're doing with our students a project about apartment buildings in, in, in San Diego County, and I can't tell you how many apartment buildings right now in San Diego, are shared by multiple households. Mm -hmm. One bedroom is for family. So it's not out there in the 40s in Russia. I think there are some echoes to what is happening today. Um, so an apartment per family sounds obvious, but it was uh, it was the uh, sort of novelty uh, with its own independent facilities, right? Um, and for them, that was a new architectural but they had to think about it. It was not just a policy thing, but it also had uh, design implications, obviously. To make this possible, they also tapped into a rethinking construction industry by industrializing it, prefabricating it. I think that's something that resonates with us today, too. They used something called type design. I'm going to show you a few examples. And then they understood housing as an urban planning scheme. As I said, it's, it, they have something called um, these micro districts. You see an example from uh, from this one, Neodavnicheryomushki, which is one of the um, most, you know, uh, one of the early ones in Moscow, uh, and perhaps one of the one that is most um, best best known, uh, where they uh, the architects had the chance to sort of showcase and experiment with uh, different systems of construction, but also uh, different uh, designs for small apartments, and as well to prove to themselves and to the, to the entire nation that there was an advantage to this neighborhood scheme, which it, they called the, um, the, micro, the micro districts. So you see some of the collective spaces that were um, provided along, along with their housing. Um, so again, you know, I think <laughs> there, if I can just do one thing this morning is perhaps to shift your perspective about what mass housing meant for a whole part of the world. So this, mo this model is born in the, the Soviet Union, but really uh, migrates to the entire Soviet world, including Eastern Europe, but also Africa, right? Um, and it provided Soviet citizens, right? We, we, Think of them all small, small, drab, poorly built apartments. But quite on the contrary, it also provided the citizens with uh, major modern amenities, running water, sewer systems, central heating, and also including for them various uh, ac access to various public facilities from 
daycare to small health clinics, shops, cinema, uh, you know, major culture was also important to um, Right, so let's see. Um, perhaps one more thing is that far from being a top-down solution imposed by the government, it was really the outcome of a tremendous amount of experimentation at the level of architectural planning institutes. So they had, for instance, for this, I think they tried out something like uh, 200 types, uh, of which then they selected down um, something like 22, which I, I will show in a, in a map. Um, so perhaps this is the time to show you the, the plan of the neighborhood. So as I said, one of the important principles of housing was that it ought to integrate planning, right, at the neighborhood scale with the architecture. So it's not just about providing the buildings, but out of think thinking about them in this kind of ecosystem of services, circulation, green spaces. Um, so um, I can, let's see. So you, you've seen the splash pools. Here are some, it's number 30. You can see that several of these are, are distributed throughout. Let me just show you a list of all the functions that were included in a, in a neighborhood like this. Um, and you can see there is a lot of things about children, such as um, uh, they, you know, child care all the way from infant to, um, to schools. Uh, there is uh, playgrounds and there is uh, an abundant access to, uh, to green spaces. You can also see uh, in the left column that every single building is built slightly differently, right? This is like a test case for them to see what works best. So you have brick and you have brick and block and you have just block and you have um, lightweight concrete and you have cinder blocks and you also have poured, poured concrete. So they, they use this uh, as a laboratory. The other thing is that you can see that the buildings are these uh, continuous slabs that are um, allows them to distribute it throughout uh, throughout the um, throughout the area right so instead of organizing housing along existing streets right that's the model in which the people design the street the planners design the street and then the architects come and put the building on the street they thought of the circulation system and the housing system together um, and this, uh, these, this bar, these bar buildings were extraordinarily flexible in their ability to be placed more or less anywhere, right? So they had, um, unlike, for instance, a courtyard building or a building that had to turn a corner. So it, it allowed them to reduce the number of different designs needed for the construction of these blocks. Um, it allowed them to preserve topography of the site more easily and um, they also made a point to route most of the heavy traffic around the neighborhood and to calculate very carefully uh, this network of domestic and cultural services that uh, all of which could be accessed by uh, 15 minutes of walk from any single uh, housing unit right? so everything ought to happen within um, within walking distance. So here are some other uh, images of the construction process. I want to spend some time on their plans, uh, which they call pipes, as you can see. Uh, it, it's a fairly regular um, module, uh, and it, they, you can see that there are these bays, which are quite regular. And within this kind of grid system, um, they are thinking about how to produce maximum flexibility in terms of interior, interior organization. So K7 is just one type, right? Within that type, you can organize the floor plan of one of these modules, right? As three, two bed, three apartments of two rooms each, right? One apartment, two apartments. 
can organize the same thing as three apartments of different sizes. One room, two rooms, three rooms. Um, you can organize it into four of one room, one room, two rooms, two rooms. Also four, one room, two rooms, three rooms, etc. So uh, maximum uh, maximum flexibility uh, given uh, fairly uh, standardized dimensions. They spent enormous amount of time thinking about how these configurations could accommodate various types of families. So they spent enormous amount of time thinking, right? We, I said a lot about how they thought about the neighborhood scale. They also spent a lot of time thinking about the furniture scale. And how would these various types of households, uh, how could they be accommodated into these, uh, into these uh, configurations? And often they would uh, design backwards, right? So what would it mean to have, to accommodate, for instance, um, a household with one child, two parents, and one grandparent, right? How would you, sorry, um, or here, for instance, how would you accommodate a single parent, right? A single parent with two children, um, or a single parent with two children. If you're again, sorry, in one case it's the mother, not in the other case it's the father. It's actually very interesting. Or a multi-generation, multi-generation household. So there is nothing standard about the standardized apartment, uh, right? It's actually a, a, a real um, multiplicity. Of, uh, of solutions. So they are they are they are manuals with hundreds of these. That this is what the this is what the design institute institutes produce, and therefore it really cut down on the uh, on the speed of construction and production, because depending on what amount of land you had and what the amount of population you wish to house you could deploy these uh, fairly rapidly. So these are examples from inside. A lot of attention was paid to uh, things like uh, light, windows, and cross ventilation. Uh, there, was, there were whole decrees about how to make sure that the bathroom had access to natural ventilation, for instance. Very, uh, very meticulous. Um, <coughs> Very meticulous uh, design uh, um, solutions. Second case study, I want us to go to Turkey uh, in the city of Izmir. It's a port city. Um, and here, you know, um, the, the difference perhaps I should explain is that uh, this kind of housing that we've seen in the Soviet Union, which is definitely a public uh, form of housing. It was housing for everyone, right? For uh, no matter your uh, household composition, no matter your uh, household income, no matter your ethnic background, right? Housing was considered to be uh, this kind of, uh, you know, it's a public good period. It's for everyone. I'm gonna show you now two, two case studies in which housing is in fact targeted for a particular social group. Um, often for the most vulnerable, the least privileged. And so it's a particular understanding of social, you know, of social housing when it's actually for, for just one. So this is this is the case of uh, Turkey. Um, so in Turkey as well, as I said, there was uh, in, the, in the 1950s uh, there was a prevailing affordable housing uh, problem and shortage. So for instance, in between 1955 and 1965, the rent had gone up something like 150%, also a very familiar scenario. Um, and obviously it had become very difficult for um, lower income residents to find proper housing. Uh, and then that had increased the um, growth of what we call informal, informal housing. Uh, trying to make do uh, in these settlements that were uh, not planned, not official. Uh, the, obviously, the quality of that housing was uh, was very low. Um, 
very similar, but something like a third of the uh, working class uh, homes in his near were house where single family, sorry, 30% of the working class households were in single room, uh, single room homes. So this, uh, this neighborhood in particular housed the Roma minority. Uh, they, they had lived there for several generations. Uh, it had about 5,000 people who uh, lived in, um, you can see from the, uh, from the aerial view, they had lived um, for, uh, for many generations in uh, these uh, tiny detached housing packed uh, together along streets and passageways, uh, which did not, you know, follow any regular quotation marks plan. Um, house, houses were, it was more like sheds uh, made of both permanent and temporary materials. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, most houses had small gardens, but also a lot of the neighborhood's life was uh, organized outdoors, so people spend an enormous amount of time um, socializing with neighbors outside, both during day and at night. So you can see uh, the municipality in this case, so it's not the central government, but rather the city itself that decides to provide uh, housing for, for this minority, and you can see the original plan here, um, and only seven of these buildings were built can see them here. One, two, three, and then a few more here. I'll, I'll come to see them here. So, um, but it gives you a sense of the context in which, uh, in which they were built. Um, perhaps I should say a word about financing, right? So in the, in the, it's an important question. Um, in the Soviet example, right, the state, which here in the U.S. we call the government, uh, and the state system ensured everything, like the planning, the design, the construction of housing, and the residents paid either very low rents or were allowed to purchase uh, at a very low price, right? So it was a universal system, not especially targeting a particular uh, special group. In this case, uh, this is for the Roma community. All the residents were given title ownership to the apartment units, uh, provided that they paid a very low monthly uh, rent to the municipality. And I think after um, uh, I, I think after ten years, the they, they had you know, it was like a very very low mortgage uh, mortgage system. They didn't call it mortgage; they called it. Um, so, 120 families received some, such housing, so it's a very small uh, percentage. But uh, here too, although it is a much smaller uh, project, there is enormous amount of attention to the collective spaces. So you will see that the, the apartments are fronted by this very large uh, gallery or a corridor, which is meant for circulation, right? It has, it has stairs. Um, but it is uh, also, it is an open, if you, you can see them here, they're, they're open, they're used as balconies uh, where people spend time, hang clothes, um, and uh, it becomes sort of shared communal space. The other thing that's quite interesting in this project is that one enters directly in the living room, from this, uh, from this sort of semi-public, uh, semi-public gallery. Um, so it's, um, it's, um, so there's, there's no entrance hall, right, or no, or no short corridor, which is perhaps would have been more typical in a Turkish home to provide privacy. So the moment you open the door, you can actually see inside the apartment. Not only can you see inside the apartment, but you can see all the way back uh, into, this, uh, into this room, which is actually the bedroom. There's only this very small corridor here that distributes a circulation to the bathroom. This is the toilet, and this is the very, the very small kitchen. So you can see that there's a sort of layered 
semi public to keep semi private and really private um, organization of the, of the spaces. So the layout is not turned inward uh, by putting visual barriers on, on the contrary. Right? And that was an attempt by the architects to uh, respond to uh, the lifestyle of the, uh, of the inhabitants which they uh, sort of understood from talking to them and also from, uh, from observation. So here are some examples of how the, <coughs> how the galleries are used. You can see that the doors have some uh, have sort of visual doors that can be turned. <coughs> here is more. Obviously, some have encroached, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but nonetheless, it remains, you know, you can see the chairs, you can see the Shoes, right? It's very much seen as, um, as a part of their home. This is the outdoor, and this is how the outdoor is sort of animated by various uh, local. I think this is uh, this is a wedding. <coughs> this is a festival. Okay, last uh, last is an American project, uh, perhaps the least happy one in the book. Um, <laughs> It's been demolished in 2018, right? So this is a history, right? <laughs> um, so this is uh, this is Church Street uh, Church Street South housing, uh, which um, was popularly referred to as the jungle. Um, in this case, it was originally a privately owned and managed low-income uh, housing complex in uh, in Connecticut. Almost, I'm almost done. Um, it was originally conceived as a low and moderate income housing co-op. Um, although the developer went bankrupt and abandoned the project, this was, it, was, it was taken over by the Housing and Urban Development uh, HUD. Um, and then, in other words, it was played by a, a variety of issues throughout both its planning and construction. Um, and um, it, I think it was in many ways uh, doomed by this very complex funding system that we have, and that, we, that they had and that we still have, and a maze of multiple agencies <coughs> that had sort of partial responsibility and partial control. So it was never very clear uh, who who was the sort of agent uh, responsible for this? So this was born. Uh, this project was born from a big federal initiative that is called, uh, you know, the Urban Redevelopment Initiative. You probably have heard about it. It gave us a bunch of highways, including uh, including the five. Uh, the problem with uh, this redevelopment is that it uh, ran through uh, some of the most vulnerable. Neighborhoods and uh, demolish them uh, in center in central cities. So you can see there's a very large swath that was demolished here uh, to pass uh, to pass this highway. Um, it, uh, it the area had been sort of uh, had a kind of community before before the, the demolition. It had um, sort of mixed use markets, small homes, and a very dense network. Um, irregular streets, but um, so they demolish it. Sorry, um, and they uh, they actually displaced the community. They built back 500 units, uh, but most of the most of, and that not that, that didn't. I think there was a net loss of several hundred units in the end, um, and the community was never able to uh, to fully. Uh, Really establish itself, and in fact, in 2018, right, it was demolished again. So we often talk about people who are twice displaced. Right? The first time. Um, so perhaps this is a good time to make another observation: is that um, all these experts, right, that we've seen, including uh, the, the team of planners and architects that work here. Uh, in, including the developers, they um, they claim with various uh, degrees of earnestness that they act in the interest of the residents, right? Um, but in fact, housing projects extract often a huge pr 
rise from the city and its residents, even when the earth is low, and especially when the earth is low, in the case of the West, often in the, in the form of uh, displacement and uh, sort of unrelated community. That community that is so important, right? The neighborhood, the sociability of the gallery, the, the one that should be, in fact, uh, built in anything we do when it comes in terms of housing. Right? Okay, so firstly, invite me, Van der Rohe, big architect, uh, doesn't work very well. They bring in another important architect from, from Yale. Uh, his name is Charles Moore, and his, uh, and his company, um, which the name of the company is somewhere in the in the slides. But so it's Charles Moore and his and, and his associates who come to revive the project uh, and uh, are asked to provide a more contextual uh, development. So uh, it's kind of hard to read because the slides are not oriented in the same way. But these are the railways. So in other words, these railways, and you can see the train station here. This is the train station, but a very important train station, um, <coughs> New Haven. And so the, in other words, the rail, sorry. The railways are here, and the train station are here. It's not on the, it's not on the plan. But if you can see, this is a senior living tower, and this is a public housing, also for seniors that are uh, that are not exactly part of the project. So this is how it looked before 2018. Uh, the railway is here, so I'm turning you around a bit. This is the train station, and then this is one of the senior housing, this is the other tower. But this is the Charles Moore project, which comes to be known as Church Street. So there too, um, there's, there's a lot of a very good design uh, thinking, um, but the, the the financing structure is quite different. It's managed privately, and there's only one very small public element in it, and that's the tower. In fact, it's the only one that's still uh, that's still standing. Um, it was intended to be cooperatively owned, but then they never really got to that. Um, one of the reasons is that. HUD foreclosed on the, on the developer, uh, and HUD also refused to, to provide funding for ev everything that was community related, such as daycare centers and um, you know, the, the parks. Um, so they, in other words, as it's often the case when it comes to public housing, we, fa we fail short of those things that would actually be made. So uh, Charles Moore received an uh, enormous amount of praise for this project. I think it got the Progressive Architecture Award, cover story of the New York Times, um, you know, all sorts of uh, all sorts of praises. Uh, and it is true that it is a very uh, sensitive uh, design that, um, for instance, uh, takes the parking out of all the residential on the edges so that the residential spaces are not burdened with, uh, with that. It has very large communal green spaces, such as these, right? Um, um, and also playgrounds but that are sort of overlooked by these quite, uh, quite efficient large uh, apartment flats and duplexes. It uses, it tries to animate uh, this environment often with these uh, colors, with super graphics. And it has enormous amount of, here's some, some more examples, also here too, enormous amount of uh, individuality in the organization of the, uh, of the apartment. So it has one, two, three, and five bedrooms. Some of them are on a single level, some of them are actually split, which they call the duplexes. Um, so high level of individuality, a lot of attention was made to this individual entrance. Let me show you how you want that. You can see here the stoop and the little porch. So in the hope that people would um, sort of identify, um, have a sense of privacy and uh, spaciousness, 
uh, in stark contrast to these ambiguous large spaces of the supposedly public art. However, why was it demolished? Um, very early on, it became as often a kind of place for, where we would concentrate poor, poor things, right? So concentration of poverty. This is when social housing is only for the very poor. It was meant to be a much more kind of diverse community, but it did not work like that. It was absolutely isolated. I'll go back to the, I'll go back to the, uh, to the aerial view. You can see that there are large, very hard to cross um, highways and roads on every single uh, side. Uh, it didn't, uh, so it, it made the complex very difficult to access. And to make matter worse, uh, the housing development was also located in one of the most polluted areas of the region, right? So when I say that house, public housing is very expensive for the poor, that's another way in which they pay, they pay the price, right? Um, lack of routine maintenance, <laughs> that's another, that's another thing. It was passed on to various management companies. I will spare you the list, and they finally did demolish in 2018. What replaced them? I think nothing. I think now they're doing some kind of mixed use, um, much higher end, much higher end development. Perhaps you have to know more about it. So, what, very briefly, what are the lessons we can draw from this? One, of course, is the importance of the collective spaces, right? Site plans are more, much more significant than architectural style. Uh, they orchestrate the natural environment, but they also affect social life, safety, uh, both planned and serendipitous, right, for residents of all ages. Communal spaces are from all places, right? From the balcony all the way to large park communities. The last lesson I want to say, and perhaps that's the where, you know, I said this before and I was told it's a very un-American way of thinking, <laughs> is that the, you know, American, in the US, we really mythologize the market when it comes to housing. And we look down on those who need assistance as homes. Um, and the rhetoric, in fact, builds a quite uh, inaccurate contrast uh, between the notion of market housing and public housing. Um, and it condemns public housing, in particular, as a form of welfare state, right? Uh, and the worst of modern design. And that is despite the fact that it is not true, right? The most important um, the most important subsidy that the government does when it comes to housing, it's actually in the form of mortgage interest deduction, uh, which were, you know, I, I think it used to be 60 billion a year in terms of lost revenue, now it's down since Trump at 25 billion a year. Um, so this is support, right? This is a support that we give to middle and upper income homeownerships, a homeowner or homeowners. Uh, so significantly more than we give to assist uh, poor and working class citizens. Um, so in the U.S., although there's a lot of rhetoric, uh, public programs have never provided more than 5% that was at its height, more than 5% of total reduced housing production. And the poor have often been left out of that. So the idea that the market, left to its own devices, will fix the problem, uh, I think the historical evidence points very much to the reverse, that markets not only don't fix the problem, but actually produce scarcity and high prices. Um, the book, I think, allows us to make the observation, uh, obvious, but perhaps worth repeating, that housing does not necessarily need the mechanisms of the real estate market to exist, to function, and to function well. Um, it's not, you know, good housing is not linked in any way to buying, selling, speculating, and owning, right? Um, and I think, uh, you know, I gave you just three examples, but there's plenty of others in the book where housing is almost entirely decoupled from the, from the markets. Uh, and in fact, you know, these histories show that often there's a friction between housing and the logic. 
Um, so I'll stop here. I'm sure this will um, uh, raise some questions uh, about um, what to do. Um, Don, do you want to come back? <laughs> yes, thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you one right off hand, uh, even though it's maybe not in any of your area of expertise. Uh, what happened in China? I, my impression is that they built all upper scale housing and it sat empty and now the whole market has collapsed. Right, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert of um, China, but we have actually an author, Samuel Jiang, who has written about China in this book. Uh, he deals with the earlier period. So I think you're absolutely correct. That there's a kind of lots of empty apartments, and it turns out that actually, from a financial point of view, it's facing collapse because of that. Um, but what he's looking at the earlier period, what happened just after Mao, and it's kind of very surprising. I was surprised to find out about what he's saying. Basically, all this production-based uh, housing that was in China, because after the revolution, it turns out that they did not prioritize like the Soviets to build mass housing, but their slogan, according to him, was production first, living second. So they, they basically built those kind of urban kind of production centers attached with some housing. And he shows that actually in building a middle class uh, in China, those who had access to these kind of housing units in the city were kind of advantaged. So they basically became kind of enriched by this. So I'm probably I'm not doing a very good job of telling his argument, but it is it is a chapter in the Well, I think to, to, to say something to your question, um, for me, the big, one of the big lessons of the book is that we have to pay very close attention to how these things are financed. Right? So it's, you know, we care a lot about design, obviously, but there's as much decisions and as, many, as much implications, and in fact, often more, uh, when it comes to how how we pay for this, right? And I think the, the the system of financing tells us tells us a lot about what where the priorities. Right? So when we say it's a political decision, it means where does the money come from, and where will the money go if there is a problem? Right? That's the political question. And as I definitely can speak for myself, uh, often architects, you know, we know the. We, we have little to say about that, and because housing, and we should be more, um, we, have, we ought to have more to say about how we should, be, uh, where should we should find the resources to pay for this. Housing is expensive uh, to build for good reasons, right? Because we employ people, we want to, you know, there's a labor cost, it's important to pay workers, fair salary, materials are expensive, so it's an expensive proposition. There's no way we can get around it, right? Now the question becomes, how do we pay for it, right? Do we, do we make it so that there, there is some kind of speculative profit aspect to it, or do we decide that it is actually an important priority and we, we have to pay for it altogether? Don't call this my, what do you call this? When I proselytize again. Um, let me ask a question about the American approach, which is home ownership is building wealth. Everybody thinks that unless you own a house, you'll never make it in society in your generation. Now, in, around the world, is that the same attitude now, or how do you, it seems like it's growing, but what do you make of it? Um, it's definitely true in the U.S. that the path to prosperity is to home ownership because our wages are so low. <laughs> My 
right? So we are we are in an asset economy, which often, and I you know I say this as a household with two, with two incomes, by far our our wealth is in our house, right? So we we are in a system of assets in which uh, our prosperity is tied to this piece of real estate. Of course, it's very difficult to tell homeowners that you're you know they're going to build mass housing next to you and your property values are going to go down. Um, but I think this should make, so, make, make us alert to the fact that historically and in other, um, in, in other cultural, social, political contexts, um, it, was your, it was your work, right? Your, you know, your salary, your, that provided the main source of income. I think in the US, the, the balance is absolutely, and that's why we have such a stronghold on the need to or on the need to own because it's often the only form of retirement. Right? How are people going to pay for retirement? So very quickly, I see there is a question, but before um, to address basically your question, um, there is a wonderful book um, by an African American author. Uh, her last name or their last name is Taylor. And it's called Race for Profit, and it looks at 1970s in America. And I should say I learned quite a lot reading this, because it starts basically with, with this program, federal program, to reverse the effects of redlining. I mean, you, you know that actually people of color, especially African American communities, have been locked out of this system of home ownership, basically, by the private system mortgage and that would make it more expensive for them to, to have access to finance, right? This is what established red line. So in response to that in nineteen seventies she they are telling the story that the federal government started with this system of privileging, uh, especially prioritizing people of color to become homeowners. And then but the book turns out to be incredibly depressing how it because when basically you do not provide an alternative to that and you force people who don't have financial needs to invest so much to basically being a homeowner, the result becomes a predatory system where basically real estate agents are forcing people who are who should not be homeowners to own homes. And at the end the federal government basically just steps in. And after foreclosure, just like pays for it. So, right? This turned out to be a quite uh, cautionary tale, and I learned quite a lot about that, so I recommend that book, Race for Profit. So, I grew up in public housing, and you know, I, from, from a baby till I was 15 years old, and I experienced the good, the bad, and the ugly of public housing. Our rent was like, we had three rooms, and our rent was, first we started out with five rooms. And then when my grandpa died, I lived with my grandparents. And then we went to, when my grandpa died, we went to four rooms. And then after that, we, we ended up, my grandmother and I, I lived with my grandmother. We had, fifth, we had three rooms. Our rent was like $25. I think that's how much we paid. And we experienced everything in public housing that uh, you hear about. And I just wanted to let you know we lived there for 15 years. And uh, they had wonderful playground facilities and they had centers uh, where you could go learn crafts and learn music. And uh, we spent, uh, every Tuesday was a movie and it cost 10 cents. Mm -hmm. And you would go to a movie and gather there with other little children and watch uh, cartoons and, and uh, uh, various movies that would entertain children. And they had gardens there where you could grow vegetables and, and all kind of things you could grow there. And it was, a, when it started out, it was a lovely center, but over the years it deteriorated and it got really bad and uh with a lot of crime and a lot of a lot of stuff that went on there 
And that was in Cleveland, right? Well, it was in Cleveland. Yes. Yeah. So, in San Diego, there is this big push for housing, and but in California, it's now being pushed down to the citizens having no voice, right? And to what extent do you as architects or as planners see the underlying infrastructure to support the population being taken into consideration? Right, that's a good question. Well, from our experience with Encinitas, there's zero consideration. <laughs> yeah, they're building this huge apartment complex there, right? Corner of Rancho Santa Fe Road. And, yes. Mm. But that's because we think about housing as the voice of right? So think of this question of urban planning, which means um, how do we, you know, land use, transportation, services, infrastructure, schools, um, we don't, there's no opportunity to think about all those things at the same time. Uh, it is often, you know, the, it is often it's fragmented, very, it, it is not the, you know, it's not the unified system. It would require not just infrastructure, but also rethinking about how we deploy expertise, so just think of how cities deploy expertise so that the architects and the citizens and the planners and the engineers uh, think about this at the same time. I think this gets to an important sort of observation. Um, would the population that you say has lost democratic input, that control of their uh, seat control to plan the place? Uh, to do a better life. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Michael's a planning authority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is, this is the, the challenge is that we can equate um, the loss of the voice of the people uh, with the voice of the people. And what I mean by that is when the state voice of the people which effectively has politicians. No no, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying when the state voice of the people votes and says we want more housing, um, you hear the locality say we've lost our voice. Mm -hmm. But the voice at the state level that's voting are those people that don't yet have the homes potentially. Mm -hmm. And so it, this this is the thing that I find. Um, you know, it's difficult to have this conversation, honestly, um, when we throw out terms like Sacramento is a communist authority, when in fact they are acting on the voice of a people, but maybe not the people of, of that particular locality of Encinitas or Colorado that have been privileged to have something that those others do not. So it, it's, it, it is, a, I think, a, an interesting point. It's a, it's a very good point. And I think, I mean, I observed, like, you observed what happened in Encinitas with, the, like, the train crash <clears throat> in slow motion. And I think one thing that was, was very unfortunate is that the city council um, started with the presumption that of course, people do not want housing, right? Instead of basically starting and just like giving the people good solutions that they will want. Because regular folks, like, so I don't accept the premise, the assumption that people are selfish, right? So if you show that basic alternatives, because all of them are saying that my children can't live in the town, I grew up. I mean, everybody, even those who are privileged enough to have a home in an affluent community, they face basically the housing problem in their way. So I think the responsibility of the planners, of the city councils, but also architects, is to be able to show alternatives to people that they will want to accept. 
that's why, I mean, there is really a very important educational aspect to this, that I find it very important that, for example, at USD, when I give lectures to students, it's very important for me that the majority of my students are not going to be architects, but maybe leaders in the society in different ways. But they need an education so that their imagination is unlocked. They don't think that they are only a few alternatives. I think you guys are doing great work. Can I maybe say a couple other options? I, I'm a developer. Sure. I was sure. educated as an architect. Yeah. They got an urban design degree at yeah. St. Louis or Fruit Idol is in my backyard. Right. So mm -hmm. all of these things resonate with me, um, you know, to, to, to great depth. And you know, one of the things you guys uh, showed but didn't touch on it is instruction, the efforts to create great housing in the States is our building code regulation. Mm -hmm. The ability to have point access blocks or single stairwells to get up to those units creates a, a, a tremendous architectural opportunity, which mm -hmm. we're now trying to address in the state, right? right? But, um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's important when you speak to an audience like this to remind them that, hey, some of these solutions aren't possible here. I have great architectural folks right. and floor plans from Europe none of which would adapt to the United States. Right. So that, the, the, the regulation is, is an important one. The other one is you showed campus plan housing projects, much like Food I Go or this Turnbull Development in Haven, which I think are a paradigm which does not really exist in many contexts here in San Diego. Um, there are at least a context in which I live in, which is these existing urban neighborhoods. And so, I think it's important to understand sort of as we densify existing neighborhoods, of which there's many examples over time of cities densifying, that there is a there's a different architectural problem there than there is maybe in a large campus plan uh, development like you show. And so being able to differentiate between those two things and and give different learning les lessons for the context of that specific area, and see this may be very different from North College, right? right. Um, I think those are some things that maybe you know, also need to be identified. And the last thing is just financing. And this is the most frustrating thing for me because I'm actively working on doing mixed income housing in conjunction with developers that largely rely on subsidy and tax credits from the federal government and the state governments. And as you actually pointed out, um, those systems that actually made the new data development fail. Um, you know, are uh, well-intentioned systems to provide social housing for us in this country, but the systems in and of themselves prevent that thing which we want to provide. And what is that thing that we want to provide? Great, healthy communities right. that are mixed income, that are mixed generation, that have a variety of housing types, yet the entire financing structures that those uh, bodies create do just the opposite. Uh, monolithic housing uh, typologies uh, uh, focused on specific income levels, consolidating them in, in, um, you know, into groups. Um, and it seems like we have not learned those big picture lessons. Um, and so it really is a holistic, okay, I mean, I'm not saying you could say it was a holistic problem, but um, it really is a holistic problem of how do we house populations in this country, given the regulatory uh, and and you know urban character. Well, let's see, what's the right word? Yeah, the context of actual neighborhood infrastructure. Um, that they are different problems to a certain degree than the ones that we had in um, Eastern European countries. So I'll stop. But that, you know, you know I, I, I always agree with Andrew. But I, I, and I just still do. I, I think what we don't do is we don't, we don't do what Julian Anderson said. We talk about housing, and that's we should never talk about housing. We should talk about neighborhoods and how all these pieces fit together. And that's who we run up all. The uh, New Haven project that you showed was the thought process was to build neighborhoods, but it was also based on we had leftover land from the freeway connector that wiped out most of the neighborhoods. Very well-meaning project, but it was put in a site that was isolated from neighborhoods, 
And then we have to integrate it. We don't think holistically about these things. The city is not doing that now. And we'll end up with the results that will not be satisfactory. I would argue that the Encinitas thing, though, is a little bit of race and class. It's been going on a lot longer than 2020. Oh, sure. And uh, it, it is, we're not sure who we want in the neighborhood. And I think that, that plays a role in it. I'm from New Haven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it was quite ugly. <laughs> New Haven is a home to a lot of brutalistic architecture. That's true. Marcel Breuer, Paul Rudolph, Richard Christian, but there are probably other names I don't even know. But this was a eccentric type of modern architecture at the time that was built. Very hostile to the building community. Thank you. I think there was a gentleman at the back. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's obviously a very uh, complicated you know, one-hour session to, to, to tackle everything. But um, one thing that you said about you don't think people are, are innately selfish, and I and I agree with that. But at the same time, I think we're all survivors, and we've all lived in a community like San Diego, for example, where in order to survive, people are becoming more selfish. And so there's a um, there's a really big divide, and, and now it's turning in, and maybe the media has something to do with the, the attacking of each other, but there's basically renters and owners. And so, you know, uh, since I can remember, there's always been this talk of, like, rent control, and, oh, well, we don't want to be like San Francisco, we don't want all these places to go, you know, to deteriorate because all oh, the rent control, no one maintains, and blah, blah, blah. So there's been this scare. And then, you know, since I can remember, the goal is to own a home. And then, so you have, I have a lot of friends that have owned homes, and now they're very against the things that they were pro, pro like when they were renters, right? And the last thing you want is, like you said, the you know, home value to go down because some building that is you know, perceived or maybe the media influences more as public housing, and a lot of it's term, you know, terminology. People get scared, or, or the ADUs that you see like on the news, and they're like, you know, they look like these huge two story gigantic monoliths. And, of a one-story residential neighborhood. And the news puts that out, like, this is affordable housing, and people are like, well, I don't want that. And it's so it, it goes to design, it goes to perception, it goes to media, but it's creating this, like, selfishness. But people are like, you know, it's kind of changing our personality, where we weren't selfish before. And now we are like, it's not just not in my backyard, it's like division, which leads to, like, the race and class thing, right? Um, so, Kind of going back to what you were saying about who is the voice and who are the people. I think at a certain point, the professionals need to kind of take over, right? Like people can have votes in a community meeting and everybody from different walks of life votes. But I trust the planners more than my neighbor, right? So like how do we cross that bridge from letting the, the architects, the planners, developers, like responsible developers have a say more than the countless community meetings that are slowing everything down besides the regulation of like permitting to, you know. How, how do we how do we bridge that more than the design of infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Oh, but many of the comments I was gonna make have been brilliantly made by some of the other folks here, but um, I was in Singapore last year, and I was insanely impressed by what they have done. Are, are there any, is, is Singapore included in any of your Do you, I mean, that, that's an example that I'm aware of, because one of our contributors, uh, Miles Rulandini, actually worked on I think, Singapore. I, I gathered from his work that there is a connection between the English experiments, um, public housing experiments, so what, what really impressed me is that first of all, first of all, Singapore was detached from Malaysia at the end of World War II because it was so poor, nobody wanted it. And they're, they're an island under themselves, they're very small, and they have no water supply. So the way they survived was they had a long-term treaty with the mainland for water. But that that's ending, I think, in another 20 years. So they got a problem, and they had they had mixed races, um, not a lot of uh, not, not a lot of uh, natural um, amenities, etc., and a very poor population. And 
they work together, they've got three different uh, races that get along beautifully, they have made sure everybody has a seat at the table, everybody gets housing, and, and everybody gets uh, starts off as rental housing, and you get a long-term lease. So you get you know, get what is appropriate for your family size and your stage of life. You pay a lease on that, it's your lease. If you want to move to a different situation, you own the lease and you can sell it to somebody else. And they get it until the lease runs out and then they have to apply for another lease because the leases are owned by the government. So the government provides all the housing they come up with all the rental agreements, but they make people owners. They have a free market. They mix the, the various housing they have, and they have wonderful public spaces. They have the same amount of greenery. They've been able to capture all of their rain ball being in the tropics and put it in the cisterns. They cleaned up an environmental toxic waste dump, and they're one of the richest places on the planet because they're very good at economics and marketing. I was insanely impressed by what I saw there. But a large part of it is they've all agreed to work together. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets a fair share, and they're sharing in the benefits, and it shows. So I, I think it's a, that's a very workable model. I don't know that it works in our democracy because we are too individualistic, uh, and we are too much involved with the free market, which I think has been a major mistake as well. Now, I'm married to an economist who is very much a free market person, and the two of us fight all the time. So, I, I think in terms of housing, free market has been a massive mistake, and it's turned San Diego into an international real estate betting organization where we've got money coming in from all over the place that is encouraging building things nobody here can afford, and nobody's living in. So, can, can I? Uh, yeah. I think there's a lot to learn from Singapore, but if, if we ignore the fact that they import all their cheap labor from Malaysia, which is not in the population center of Singapore, we're missing the there's cost of side of the housing, which is the major problem for most of us, is that it's really not sustainable if you're getting very, very cheap subsidized labor that you don't have to house. And that's how Singapore does it. Can we do that for the same but I, I think what they've done well is when they started off, everybody was very poor. A lot of people who were at the bottom of the economic ladder have been able to come up through a system that I think is more equitable than what we've got here. And the housing is part of it in that they're controlling what the, co the housing costs both on the production end and on the rental end. So it hasn't become a commodity that gets traded and monetized. And that's what we've done here, which has driven everything way out of whack, uh, to make to the point where people are putting together portfolios for investment of property that you know nationwide. That I mean that's that's sick. It's just sick. But so, the other the other thing my husband says about housing you know, from the economist section is he said owning a house is a lifestyle, not not an investment. But if you have money sure. and you want to gather wealth, there are other things to do with your money. And many people are probably better off renting than trying to put their money into a house. And we haven't pushed that <coughs> message enough. Sorry, you think about sure. I'm curious if you've seen any examples of a co-housing model being used in a more public or like combination space because I know like there's a, a huge benefit to kind of having that idea that I'm owning my home but I'm also investing in a community at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if there's been examples um, beyond just like individuals coming together and finding other individuals in the community or if there's um, some sort of a balance whether it's in the states or not. I'm not sure what co-housing is it like co -op? Yeah um like I think it's most popular in Denmark, but there's, um, I'm from Nevada City, which is in Northern California, and there's an architect there who has um, built 30 or so communities, I think, or 60 or something across the United States and Canada. And essentially, it's um, individuals who come together, they make a monetary investment into not just their personal home on the property, but also like the amenities that they want. 
they come together and they have a conversation about what amenities work for our group of community, whether it's like 30 families and it's multi-generational, so there are young children, there are you know, seniors, so when that happens, you're building a sense of community um, as well as building a sense of actual and, uh, community environment between the homes and the amenities to be able to have whether a swimming pool or a large like kitchen or things of that nature. Um, and each of these community members are monetarily investing in this uh, larger sense of built community. Uh, and then you're working with an architect and uh, either the architect is following through the entire project or it's, you're ha it's being passed off to a, a builder, um, developer, et cetera, uh, to finish the project. And at the end of it, they do own like, and they're investing into their physical like duplex or um, single home type of situation, but uh, they're kind of like townhouses meet apartment complex kind of styles. Yeah, we don't have anything like that, uh, but perhaps it's a good time to say that um, there are enormous amount of variations out there in the world about how things are done, right? Our uh, now passed away dear colleague, Peter Marcuse, would say that the housing, housing model grew, right? So the invitation is not to say, well, let's do it like in the Soviet Union, or let's do it like in Belgium, or let's do it. Uh, the invitation is to say, we can do other things, different things. The, the, there is an enormous amount of possible imaginaries about around housing. Perhaps the only thing we're saying is that housing is the most important terrain of political struggle in which architects step. And that means that we have to, um, political struggle means that not, it's not going to be kumbaya, right? It's not going to be planners and uh, community control and all at the same time, but there has to be a moment when who wins and who loses out of a housing project is discussed. And that includes, thank you for bringing up the question of financing, because that's often where these priorities get, to me, most clarified. And we have to have these discussions and make priorities, right? So that's the invitation that, that we, we enter this very difficult and struggle in which not everybody's going to win. Um, well, let's uh, close it there with one all day, I guess.